Hey, Dental Nachos crew, it is Paul Goodman with my good friend, Dr. Tarek, and the shoe is going to be on the other foot. Dr. Tarek is going to interview me. He's going to see in a minute here. Uh, Tarek, if you want to see if we can live stream this into your group, Kumandra Doctors, we can tell them the story of Kumandra Doctors from my favorite movie that you told me about, but you can see if it's possible to take this live and share it into another group. But if not, my awesome team member, Morgan, will drop into the comments how uh, people can join your group. And we'll also get this edited so you can share it inside your group. But I'm excited but to uh, be interviewed by, by you. you. You could do the heavy lifting. I'll just do the talking. Sounds great. Sounds great. I'm happy you uh, came on. And of course, you're talking about Commander Doctors. Um, you inspired me to create Commander Doctors. We were having um, some talks about negativity that's happening in the dentisting world. And I see that the message that you put out on Dental Nachos is always a positive message, a message that um, like makes us want to be positive to each other and more friendly towards each other. We're all dentists in the end. People, you said enough people hate on us. We might as well just like each other. Right. We're all dentists. We're all in the same right. boots. So t I, I, I wanted to do that interview basically to know you better personally. So start with us about F-bombs. How did F-bombs influence your life? I mean, my dad really was the person who was such an amazing mentor dad. And what he did, every dad, me included, you included, have what I call opportunities for improvement, not weaknesses, opportunities to improve. So my own dad, you know, who sadly passed away five years ago, but was an amazing dad, amazing mentor. I think sometimes when we look back on people, we are with nostalgia, we think, oh, they never did anything wrong. They were always just so right. They were perfect. And my dad was here, he'd say, I wasn't a perfect dad. I wasn't a perfect dentist. But what I strive to do was to make my children feel good about themselves and feel that they should choose their own path to happiness with, not but, with some boundaries. So if I came home from high school in the 1990s and told my dad I wanted to move to New York City to be an actor, he probably wouldn't have said, no big deal, go and do it, right? Because I don't think that's really being supportive. He wouldn't say, don't do it at all. He just kind of guided me. And one of the things that I, the reason I chose dentistry was he always said that being your own boss had a lot of advantages. And, you know, be growing up in the 90s in New Jersey, my, Gary Vee is one of my favorite people. Most people like me wanted to be in business, a doctor, a dentist, or a lawyer, so I wanted to be like George Clooney from ER. I like that show. I like the Tom Cruise from A Few Good Men and my dad. And I'm so glad I chose dentistry. I'll share along the way that I don't know if dentistry was the absolute best fit for me, but this is a but. I am the type of person that would be happy doing probably 20 different careers. If I was an accountant, there probably would be accounting nachos. You know, if I was a business person, there probably would be finance person nachos. So for me, I'm incredible. I have a lot of opportunities for improvement myself, but one of my strengths is mental flexibility and not thinking that one possible thing. You know, one of the things I think is funny, Tarek, is we talk about should you take out debt for dental school, right? right. And people say it's worth it if you know being a dentist is what you were made to do and you're going to love dentistry. Have you heard people say that? Yep. And How I, would you know, though? If right, you're I go, there's no chance to try it, right? I have this basketball here. I want to be a basketball player. You can't yeah. take practice dentist free throws. So I think what's really hard is you can't test this out before you do it. And it's such an intense career dentistry that I think that there's a lot of people in it that it's a good fit, a lot of people great fit. And then sadly, I think it's not a good fit. It doesn't mean that's a tragedy. They could shift careers. They could figure out what they like. Laura Brenner from her amazing group, Dentisting Side Gigs, is a dentist who helps dentists uh, do other things. I spoke to dentists today on two consulting calls who wanted to maybe get out of clinical dentistry. But back to my dad in the 1990s, we went to Villanova for a college application. We were sitting there, you know, college tour, 1994. And they said, there's a seven-year dental program. And I'm someone who is enthusiastic. I like getting things done. I don't like wasting time. So I said, man, if I can go to college for four, for three years and then dental school for four years. So I was part of this seven-year program with Penn and Villanova. And you know, Tarek, when they say everything in life always has like a downside, right? Everything in life always has treatment plans. You save the tooth like Private Ryan. There's good parts and bad parts, right? Well, right. this seven-year program 
was is one of the few things in life that had no downsides. So what I want to tell you about is I got to go to Villanova and I was already accepted into Penn Dental as long as I maintain a reasonable GPA and reasonable DAT scores. So people might say, what if you don't want to go to dental school? What you could do if you didn't want to go was just stay for another year and get a biology degree. So they had set us up with what I thought was a perfect system, you know, seven year program. So for me, the path to getting into dental school was a lot less stressful. My dad was a huge help, but he didn't help me get into Villanova. Nobody cared that my dad was a dentist when I applied, but with being in the seven year program, there was less pressure. And I think I was able to enjoy my college experience more. So that was my early days, Villanova College, Penn Dental School, seven year program. My dad was a great role model, never forced my brother and I to do dentistry. He had a good attitude towards it. He didn't have an overly positive one, but he didn't bring negativity home with him. He liked being a dentist in our town. One of the key parts of the story, Tarek, and one of the reasons I would have never started dental, not I never would have been a dentist without this. My dad had a partner, 50-50 partner, and I saw the value of his partner covering for him on vacation, talking about ideas in the office. If my dad was a solo GP, I don't think I would have become a dentist. No um, uh, disrespect or, or criticism of solo GPs. I know you practice as that before you had an associate. Just for me, I like collaborating with other people all the time. And that was really attractive to me. And we now have, we'll tell you, but we have like 10 dentists working in our organization full and part-time. So for my dental life, being part of a team and building a team with my dad sort of guiding me that way was a big part of it. Was It was a big inspiration. You're a people's person, it's clear. Uh, did, did your dad take you to, to his office, for example, to show you what fillings are, what crowns yeah, are? It was funny, my like dad, that. in the olden days of his time, and he was a, such a well-respected person in our community, sports coach, dentist, amazingly friendly guy. Um, you know, when he passed away, one of the nicest things about someone said about him was, you know, Dr. David Goodman, he made life look easy, but life wasn't easy, but he just had a good attitude towards it. But I used to go in with all emergencies. I actually would bring this... Um, uh, my pink panther stuffed animal and my dad, you know, it's funny. We're letting our kids do something, Tarek, you know, our awesome daughters that people are going to freak out with 30 years from now. They're going to say, that's so dangerous. Why did you let them do that? Right. Halloween? You know, are you talking about saying, Halloween? Like, well, remember back in the day, we didn't have as many seatbelts. People would right. just, back. Yeah, yeah. my dad would put up a whole drill, a real one with like a three thirty burr. And he would let me like use it unsupervised right it was crazy i remember being in the room and i was like i would drill on something and i'd be like man this and probably if my it's mom knew about thousands it, of rpms those high speeds yeah like my, that, if my mom knew about it people. she probably would freak out and uh so i would go in on emergencies i was i did every job in the office except dentist traditional you know would work at the front desk file charts assisted my dad um so i was what i and maudie talks about this too and i really I mean i'd love to hear a little bit of your story Part of me doesn't really understand how people choose dentistry without having a family member as a dentist, because I really knew what I was getting into. I didn't know what it was exactly going to feel like when I was the person in the operatory and I had to do everything myself and how much stress that was. But I did, I did know the fast paced nature, the on stage and off stage, the people complaining about money, the, the ups of helping people smile, the downs of getting complaints. So I do find it interesting. I mean, how you can tell me how you decide to become a dentist because Maudie and I talk about this all the time. How do people decide to be a dentist without having a family member? I mean, how did you decide? Uh, well, I, my story is a little different. I've always wanted to be a journalist or a diplomat. I actually went to economics and political science for a year. Uh, then my dad had uh, friends in dental school uh, back in Egypt and I went to one of them in dental school and they showed me how dentistry is and that it's a mix uh, between art and science. Basically, she showed me what a bridge is and it's it's a good career financially. So uh, I liked it. I, I'll try it out. So I changed schools. Uh, but back to you. Yeah, obviously, you're the face of the organization. But tell us a little bit about Jeffrey Goodman, because oh, sure. we don't know him. We don't know. Him. I'm so lucky to have him as a brother. I have an amazing sister, too. She became a physical therapist. Uh, in all partnerships, and you know, I'm a big fan of the, uh, the show Billions. I don't know if you've ever seen the show Billions, but it's very good. We've got hedge funds. So whether you have a partnership with a hedge fund, dental office, even fits with marriage to some degree, most often personalities complement each other. They don't necessarily repel or attract. 
So my wife is much more keep to herself than I'm much more outgoing. We both can get along together, but I always think this, Tarek, nobody cared about the extroverts during the pandemic. Everybody said, oh, introverts, you can read a book. What about us? I like to see people. I was stuck inside for two years. Did anyone write me a card or care? They didn't, Tarek. But my brother is um, incredibly methodical, really good dentist. We both did the same residency program uh, for our GPR, you know, uh, Kindly, they voted both of us kind of like the most, out, like this little award for the Benjamin Levy Outstanding Resident. So even though we were very different people, he shines tremendously in his own way, very into systems. Uh, it's not easy being a third child. It's not easy being a third dentist. So he had to find his own way in the practice. He always jokes that he never got the dental assistant that was trained, which is kind of true. You know, my dad and I uh, got them first. Um, but he really runs the practice now. We have two locations. I like to think we complement each other well. I couldn't do what I do without having him and my dad before. You know, I used to do a, a, a lot of speaking on dental implants before dental nachos. And there was no way I could have done that if I was, you know, didn't have my dad and my brother to keep the office open. One of the things that I think practice owners, like you understand, but maybe associates don't is, why can't you take off on a Wednesday and go speak and teach, teach dentists if you love it? Because your team can't not get paid. Right. Yeah. And that's the problem. The dentist probably could do without a day of income. You know, maybe you make money speaking, maybe you don't. But if my dad and my brother weren't there running the office, that would have been it would be nearly impossible for me to be that this person. So I'm very grateful. And if you like dental nachos, you know, they deserve a lot of gratitude because they're behind the scenes people that allow that. Um, but we have similar attitudes towards life and and dentistry. And we like sports and I've always been close as brothers. My mom passed away when we were, we were young, so it made our our family close knit. My brother, my sister, and I. So he he did, he's not a Facebook guy. He'll read some of the stuff. Um, What's we'll the talk. difference in age between you? Five years. But I always say you catch up because, like, when someone's twenty seven and twenty two, it's a big deal. But forty four and thirty nine, kind of the same age, right? Same age, yeah. Um, one thing I want to share, though, I know we get into it, is like, and I hope we get this message out is. My brother would have such awesome information to share. And occasionally he does. And occasionally he'll share the great systems and he writes our checklist and that's really valuable. But what I think is sad is he doesn't really want to post too much, not because he's going to get his feelings hurt, not because, that, because he's going to get annoyed when people start kind of being very TSD. Yeah. That's so dentist. Not Definitely. going to get his feelings hurt. It's not that. It's just like, I don't know if you, you know, I was on this, group dental town, I post occasionally, but I post a lot there in 2005. And I left it because everybody was just so nasty. Too many people were nasty, not everybody. And I said, forget this, I don't feel like doing it anymore. You know, I wasn't gonna cry. I didn't feel like I just so but but you got you got a lot of negative negativity at you with a big volume. Yeah, it's true. And not only and I've, I've had one negativity against me and it shook me. Yeah. Honestly, so you take a lot of it and you stand firm, but then um, how do you turn this around? You turn it into completely the opposite before we get into residency, because I want to ask yeah. you about your residency. Sure. Well. I mean, it's, there's no perfect way to do this. And I've had, I've, I've had struggles with doing it, but what I like to think of first is somebody goes online and starts to bash or attack someone, especially if they've never met them. It's really, there's something not missing in them. I Weirdly, I'm a Gary Vee person. I feel compassion for their unhappiness. Now, even though that doesn't mean because I feel compassion for their unhappiness, I think it's okay to cause a big commotion. I strive to stand in there and keep sharing and even share more. You know, when I say hater aids thrown at me, I like to help more, give out more free CE courses because I know there's somebody on their phone in Kansas sitting there at nine o'clock about to comment and then say, I'm not gonna comment because I see Paul Goodman getting hated on and I don't want that to happen. I think everyone should share their voice and feel safe. There's, there's no perfect Facebook group, but one of the best feedbacks I get about dental nachos is, I feel very safe sharing there. It doesn't mean that they never get anybody who does TSD to them, but I think the community with great people like you kind of have, made it so it's not cool to attack people. Challenge ideas, don't attack people. Challenge ideas, disagree with respect. Say, I'm curious about why you did a PFM instead of a zirconia crown. You know, I, I believe our training, the Dental Student Hunger Games, creates a tremendous amount of insecurity, creates a tremendous amount of isolation, 
I mean, you could feel lonely when you're surrounded by people. I mean, it happens to dentists all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, dental school, you could be surrounded by a hundred classmates and still feel lonely because right. you don't think anyone has your back. You're worried your people are going to compete over these dumb competitions that no one does again. Right. So I appreciate what you said. And my thing is I try to find compassion for their unhappiness. Not always easy. I keep sharing. I don't attack them. I just challenge their idea. I love the show, Ted Lasso, you know, be curious and great stuff comes from it. But, but with all that being said, let's say that like hating on people is like littering on the street, right? Like people throwing, we should litter less. And when you see someone litter, be like, don't attack them and say, you're a terrible person for littering. Just be like, it's not cool to litter, right? Just be like, that's not cool. This person even isn't, isn't even here, right? But what's interesting, back in the 90s, Tarek, if I wanted to get in an argument with my friend, I had to show up in person and get in the argument with him, right? That's that's key to that. You're, you're behind your keyboard. What's going to happen? Yeah. If in front of a person, there's a reaction to what you're doing. Yeah. And what's even, to just deepen the craziness of it, the nacho nuts, people are hating on people when they're not even in the conversation about it, right? So that's even crazier because you got people talking behind people's back on line and the person can't even come and say, I didn't say it that way. I didn't mean it that way. That wasn't even me. You know, so I've, I've gotten, um, I mean, this is happens. I mean, it's, it's okay because I do a lot online, but I've gotten like hate on stuff. It wasn't even about me. I go, that's not me. That's Jim Smith you're mad at, right? Yeah, so, or, or, or flat out lies. I've seen yes. that on you. That's just basically a lie. Yeah. Totally true. So there's no fact checking. So my message to D1s through D44 is my age is it's great to disagree, great to challenge people, but we're all going through this tough time in life. The pandemic's made it tougher. We all have our own struggles. So just be kind or sometimes say nothing. I see stuff all the time, Tara. I just say nothing. I'll be on another group and say, I don't totally agree with this, but I don't really want to say anything right now. And I just I'll just go by. Go on by. I say SOB. So Appreciate you asking me about that. So you and brother, you and your brother went to the same residency? Yes. Albert Einstein? Albert Einstein, Philadelphia, GPR. How did you think your career would have changed if you didn't go to a GPR? For this singular decision, it was one of the best ones I made in my life. And I'll unpack it a little bit because I don't deserve all the credit for it. So during dental school, at one point, I wanted to leave dental school because my in Villanova, I got a lot of praise from my professors on my writing. And I had a political sociology professor that kind of wanted to brainwash me into becoming a political sociology professor. And he would call me in in and say, Paul, you're so good at this. This is what you should be doing. So I, when I was in dental school, I didn't struggle with the academic classes too much. I wasn't the smartest, but it would, but I had waxing up a central incisor and making the bite rims. And one time I said to my dad, I'm like, I don't know if this is for me, right? I'm really struggling. It's annoying. My dad said to me, do whatever you want, Paul. If you want to leave dental school, I support you. But remember, you want to be your own boss and all this stuff. And he said, I also want to tell you, none of this stuff you do matters in the real world. Nobody asks you to make a bite rim, right? So, you know, that really helped me get get through that. So, but doing the GPR, Tarek, I have a lot of criticisms of Penn Dental School. But the praise I give is we were required to do four weeks of externships as third and fourth year dentist. And they treated us just like residents. I chose Monmouth Medical Center, where my best friend Joe Latinelli went, and Albert Einstein. And my whole world was open to awesomeness when I was an extern there. It was exactly what I wanted, being part of a team, being treated with more respect. And I really love the implant part. I mean, I don't like the full contact arts and crafts part. I don't like the creative uh, crown prep parts. I was like, man, you just put the implant in and you build a tooth on it. It's so predictable. And you get to help people with d- uh, dentures. So picking- why do you like nachos so much? When did you catch the implant bug? Nachos, I- implants. Immediately when I saw implants being placed, I love the predictability of it. It still frustrates me till to this day. You don't know why one crown gets a cavity and another one doesn't, or this tooth fractures. I know we're never going to know these answers, and I know implants have plenty of complications, but what I want to tell my dentist friends and people is a a back tooth dental implant is one of the best products anyone can buy on earth. Not a dental product, Tarek, any product, okay? Think about someone spending four to $5,000 on a thing that they use every day to eat a meal, a thousand meals a year. And this thing lasting and lasting and lasting, 
most of the time, over 90% of the time. So when I saw this, and implants weren't even successful back then, I said, it can't get a cavity. We're replacing nothing. So that was my inspiration. And Albert Einstein, to give them a lot of credit, they're what, how dentistry should be. You collaborate with endo, you collaborate with ortho, periodontists come in to teach you to place implants. So I stayed as a first year resident, then a chief resident back in the um, 2002 to 2004, I placed 50 implants. That's a lot for a GP. And then I did a fellowship year. I made my own year where I worked part in private practice and part at the hospital where I placed another hundred implants. So I got a really amazing experience early in my career when kind of no one else was doing that. So that inspired me and kind of ignited a passion in me for dentistry then. That's awesome. Th th these numbers are awesome, actually. It's good that you got that experience. I, I see why you love the GPR. Uh, and also talking about implants, what is the alternative? Like if you have no tooth to chew with, I say this malnutrition. Do you want to say other those options are destructive, actually, yeah. like, or and uncomfortable? You know what people say online, Tara, and I, I don't, I don't want to brag at this moment, but I'm going to brag. I really want to pat myself on the back. I don't think there's another human being on earth. I'm, I'm saying this seriously that interacts with more dentists than me. Conservatively, I have 50,000 people following the different things I do. Mm -hmm. I have 10 dentists working with me in my office. Mm -hmm. I sell dental practices, okay? Mm -hmm. I speak for CE, like I go places into old school CE courses and I meet people that never heard of dental nachos. They say, what is dental nachos? I'm just here for my Saturday C. So all this, all these dentists, Tarek, People say there's dentists out there ripping out perfectly good teeth to place implants. You know what I have to say? Who are they? I've never met them. I've never met a dentist who said, oh, a number 20, I'm just going to rip it out and place an implant. Most of the time, there's, the tooth is over. It's, it's retiring. So I say to my patients, don't cry. Be happy. We invented bionic shark teeth. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, so I'm with you. You know, the alternative is a lot of times no tooth. So I'm, I'm totally bewildered why every, every dentist doesn't say implants are awesome when it's the end of the road for a tooth, we should do it. And then Tarek, I have an uncle who has eight implants. The guy's in his seventies, great guy. He gets a lot of decay now. If, if he had to do a root canal buildup and crown and crown lengthening on a number 31, he would be like, do you not like me, Paul, right? He's like, I got these six implants. So it's just a perfectly reasonable alternative to maintaining a tooth. So if you say, do you want tacos? Like I say, teeth or nachos. And someone says, you know what? I did some root canals and crowns and crown lengthening and I just don't want to do it now. I'd rather do the implant. I don't know why dentists get upset. You know what I say? Okay. I do it. Yeah. Yeah. So teeth retiring. Yeah. When, when did it hit you? Exactly when that we need to speak differently as dentists I... talking about versions and yeah, if I, don't say virgin, don't say, I mean, we, we go, we talk with this. Your tooth is a hopeless virgin failure. Who wants to hear that, right? Your tooth doesn't have a reasonable chance of working out. It's time to retire and replace it. Really waiting tables. My other life-changing experience was I was a restaurant server for a decade. I worked at a truck stop. I worked at a Mexican corporate place where part of this nacho thing came from, fine dining. And I realized early on, that while I'm a very truthful person, and while I don't want to lie, the word choices you use have a lot of energy. So if I go out and I say, hey, Tarek, the chef, the, the cook forgot about your burger, you were immediately going to be upset. So if mm -hmm. I said, hey, Tarek, they are making sure your burger is just right, not a lie, right? Let me get you a free drink while you do it. I say, wow, that really worked out better than focusing on the negative, right? So I just try so hard to focus on the positive in a realistic way, not a delusional way. Quick story, I had a person our age in, Tarek. She had number five, first time I ever met her my whole life. I'll just say her name is Jamie. It's not a real name, no HIPAA violation. Jamie comes in, first time I met her. She said, Paul, Dr. Paul, I'm so upset. Barely look at her mouth. Number five is broken off of the gum line. She's upset. And I just said, Hey, you know, there's great ways we can make this better. There's things. I said, why are you so upset? She goes, I just feel like I've done so much work on this tooth and it never worked right. And she wasn't, here's the thing, Tarek, dentists are so worried people don't like them. She wasn't talking about the dentist. She was talking about herself. So I said, hey, Jamie, how long do you have this tooth? She said, oh, 11 years. When did I go, 
That's 11,000 meals. You should be proud of that. Know what she said? You really made me feel better, Paul. That's so awesome. that's what we should do. I mean, I didn't sell her anything I tried yet. That. I, I shared that too. And on, on nachos, I tried that with a patient and the tooth needs a crown now and it fractured. And I told her this tooth has served you for 46,000 meals. <laughs> it right. did its job. We're just going to put a covering on it to protect it. And it will serve you for thousands of meals more. This is my message, Tarek. I mean, I, I'm going to write this book, uh, The ABCs of Patient Communication. It's in development. I'm going to go through every letter. And I'll say, don't say this, say this. I'm really excited about it. But I'll just tell dentists, I mean, and I'm sure I was this way at a certain point, but I just learned early. We make it weird, not the patient. We're weird, they're normal. We're mm -hmm. messed up, they have normal brains, okay? When we start to say things like, you have rampant periodontal disease, no. And you have, you know what's interesting, Tarek? And I get a lot of um, pushback on this. I don't get so much hater aid, but I'll go into other groups and I'll say, you know what? I don't call it periodontal disease, I call it bone shrinkage, okay? I don't call it vertical root fracture. I call it tooth breaking. You know what dentists say? If you talk to me like that, I thought think you were talking to me like a baby. I go, yeah, you crazy yeah. dentist, because you're a dentist and you yeah. know the language. Yeah. No one else knows the language. Do you want to go to your accountant? My accountant confuses me all the time. When they go, we're going to do add back on K1. I go, what the heck are you talking about? Can you just tell me how much money? So what I think is kind of funny is dentists sometimes, some, don't like my patient communication because they think I'm dumbing it down. I go, that's what I'm doing. I'm dumbing it down so our patients can understand it. And I always say, no problem. You don't have to be my patient. I'll treat zero dentists, my brother. That's it. That's the only one of one dentist patient. I don't want any of you as a patient. You want a dentist as a patient, right? You, you have this really good communications course actually on dental nachos. So I'm glad you're writing a book about it. Yeah. Uh, so when you were waiting tables, that's when you discovered we're I discovered that word choice matters. Words have energy, make things fun. You know, I, over the pandemic, one of my really great hybrid cases, I know you do implants, came in, he's one of my favorite patients and it's going well. And I said, let's jump after his implant maintenance. I said, let's do a quick video, Rick. And I was working with a dental assistant who'd never done it. I said, let's do the video. You know, would you do this again? You have the backup teeth and stuff. And I said to the dental assistant, what's different about me than other dentists you've worked with, right? Not better, not I'm the best. I said, do you notice anything different? Just tell me what the first thing is. She goes, you talk to patients like they're your friends and you make it fun. And that is what we should all do a little. We don't have to be so uptight. We all want our patients to like us as dentists. You said that. So if you talk to them like people, they would relate to you more. They would connect yeah. with you more. Absolutely. Um, so dental nachos, when and why? Well, it's a great question. I have a lot of to thank to my awesome wife, Mary, uh, Mrs. Nacho, which she loves that name. So back in, it always is funny when you're not using something. Well, I'm sorry. When you're used to using something all the time, you don't realize there's a time where that wasn't around, right? Like Uber. We basically can't remember that when there was an Uber, but I was out in the middle of Philadelphia trying to find a cab at one in the morning. Very dangerous, right? So in 2016, 17, there were some Facebook groups and I really was enjoying interacting them. I love Dental Town. I just got annoyed by it. Loved it. I was in the magazine. I was posting this 2005, 2010. So when I saw some of these groups out there, business of dentistry, things like that, I was communicating, but I have strong opinions, okay? I know that about myself. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna make my own group for implants and practice management. And I thought, maybe I can talk about this. What should I call it? And my, my wife and I were talking and I love nachos. And I said, I'm a broker, I'm a speaker, I'm a dentist. I do these other things, it's like a lot of toppings. Let's call it dental nachos. And Mary helped me come up with that name, one of her ideas. And then I also, do love stories. Okay. I love stories. So nachos are meant to be shared. Nachos get a little messy. There's a very funny comedian who talks about it's all nice until there's one chip left on the plate. Who takes that chip, right? You know, when we ate with the Perio Migos, Dimitri and Fadi, like you're eating, you're eating the nachos and there's like one left. Do you grab it or not? So I said, meant to be shared with friends, messy, fun. I think one of the, I'll tell you a quick story is, so I start the Facebook group. I invite my friends. There's like 50 people, right? This is not 37,000 people. And I walk around Philadelphia and my phone will go off. And remember, this is early. And it's one of my friends. And I see a picture of nachos from like Chipotle. They go, hey, Paul, I just want to let you know I'm eating nachos, but I don't think they're good enough to post on your Facebook group. <laughs> so I said, every nacho is great. So and initially, people were just posting pictures of nachos. They still do this today. But what I think was cool about this 
is it really brought a fun vibe. Everyone loves the appetizer nachos. And I just think people started liking the group because they said, hey, what is this thing about nachos? I mean, you know, I, I, uh, it's a funny story. When I give a sweatshirt to someone else, like wearing nacho swag, like my guy who worked at the gym, they'll say, oh, you better be ready because someone's going to ask you what dental nachos is. Because these people who wear it, I, I tell them, here's the story. It happened to me on the street of Philly. Some, I was walking on the street. Someone said, hey, what's dental, hey, what does dental nachos mean? I said, hey, great question. A lot of people ask that too. That's one of my talking points. I said, it's like a Mr. Rogers neighborhood for dentists because dentists need help relearning how to be nice to each other. <laughs> and then I say there's business stuff, there's sponsors. I'm authentic. You can buy stuff in there. You know, when you came to Philly, it's like a park. The park's free. You can buy stuff. I also never know why this upsets people. I, I say this, if I never invented dental nachos, Tarek, and I was just in the other groups that had sponsors, I would think it's awesome because I had to freaking get on a train and go to New York City to look at a composite in the early 2000s. So if I can see Cosmodent advertising, or if I can see local med, all of, I don't never, I never understand why dentists get mad that there's sponsors on Facebook groups. I think it's awesome because you can either buy it or you could try this, Tarek. I don't know if you try this. If you're scrolling on the Facebook group and you see a sponsor from Nachos or Business of Dentistry or Nifty Thrifty, and you don't want to buy something, you don't have to buy anything. You just scroll by. But I personally have made my practice so great. I got people billing insurance, virtual appointments. I got the amazing Kara Kelly. She's the best person ever. If you don't have an HR consultant, hire her. She's just phenomenal. Love I have her. So many great people from my phone, but you notice some dentists go, I don't like all the sponsors on this totally free group. I don't know. I don't know how to respond to that. Just scroll on by. If you, right. if, I've, I've benefited from some of your sponsors, but some are not to my taste or I don't like, I wouldn't use them. I don't have a need for them, but that doesn't mean I don't like nachos. Like you just. And this what is what I say. Get. I love right. restaurants like you. Don't you ever. So I have a lot of restaurants in Philly. You came to some. When a new restaurant opens up and I try it out and it's not my thing, it just makes me like my older restaurants better. So sometimes trying a new sponsor for whatever, I don't know, website, billing, just gives you context that, oh yeah, the one you're using is actually good. So even when you try something out that you don't love, also, I, I want to say this, Tarek, we should treat all dentists like the professionals and adults they are with their money. So be responsible. Don't sign up for a $100,000 consultant without checking it out. Sign up for their free course. Ask someone if they bought it. When someone goes, I've been duped by someone ever, right? I bought things I didn't want to buy again, not in dentistry or my personal life. Sometimes I didn't do the good due diligence or other times it just was bad luck. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. It's like any product you buy on earth. Hey. It's, it's like that buyer's remorse could happen. Um, so you grew this group branding your branding is everywhere thanks how, how did you learn about branding or what would you advise other dentists about branding i love this question what i say is live your life in the most and what this means is when you get reviews and this happened to me early on in my career and i was very upset about one bad yelp review and my dad's like stop being crazy you got good we got good reviews i don't care at all why do you care and i got upset because I, the, the person who did the review they lied right they would miss a bunch of appointments they would cancel their whole family we said that they had to pay a reservation fee they didn't have to pay and they wrote a yelp review all this office cares about is money right but they didn't put that we cancel appointments the day before all the time and we just said hey, Smith family, if you want to schedule five hygiene appointments, you need to put your credit card down. If you come, there's no charge. But if you don't come, there's like a $100 charge. So that taught me a lesson. Live your life in the most. And with branding, what that means is most people like our office and write good reviews. A few people don't like our office and write not so great reviews. With branding, see how it impacts the most. Most people find the Dental Nachos logo and mantra fun and inspiring. Some find it cheesy and dumb. They're a smaller part. So with branding, have this self-esteem, which is not easy all the time, that whatever you put out there, you are going to get people that don't like it, but focus on the most. If for some reason the most comes, I don't know if I freaking put 
a new tamale on the logo and everybody said, I don't like tamales, I would take it off, right? But if I put it on and two people didn't like it and 200 did, I would keep it on. And right. I, I don't know, if you, have you heard of Noom? Uh, the, 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 yes, the, the uh, app. Yeah, so people yeah. have told me that I remind them of Noom, which is a very comp comment. One of my, who person I trust, mm -hmm. Uh, person I trust on social media very much, a young guy said, you're a lot like Noom. You got your own language, you make it fun. So they try to make losing weight fun. And I'm sure that there's nutritionists that think they're stupid. And I'm sure there's doctors who think you can't make it like a game. You got to tell people to eat, blah, blah, blah. But Noom doesn't care because they're growing their brand. They're helping people and they're having fun. So I think you should be always be branding I have sweatshirts like this in my office. This I think is a great idea. We have a great sponsor for our swag, but however you want. Get your dental office logo, right? Okay, get your dental office logo and put on the back, ask me how much fun it is to go to the dentist, www.pankandentalcenter.com. If you wore that around town, people would be saying, it's not fun to go to the dentist. They say, well, at our office, we make it fun. And then you basically have fun there's so much ability to market for free. There really is tremendous amount of ability and dentists love free. So I think brand yourself in a fun way that fits your personality. You will always get somebody asking you about this, communicating with you. Yeah. 100%. Uh, in your offices, you have two offices, you and your brother, Pennington and Ewing. They're both in New Jersey, but you've done something different with these offices. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Just recently, one of the things that my dad would complain about, and every dentist has complained in the history of time, was checking hygiene patients. He would say, Paul, my dad was a really great dentist. He wouldn't say he's the best dentist, but he's technically excellent. But in his operatory, he was pretty serious, right? Like he was a great guy joking before, but when he worked, he really focused, right? He didn't like the, what he called breaking his concentration to take off his gloves and then go meet people. This is nuts. There's no surgeon taking out a gallbladder and the nurse goes, Billy's sutures are loose. You go, what are you doing, right? But I think this is bad for our production, disrupts patient care, but it's just how things have been done. So I have reframed during the pandemic. One of the things during the pandemic is, this might not be the right fit for everybody. My morale has become more important than my money right now. My morale has become more important than my money. So what that means is I have disengaged with insurances, which means the office will likely make less money for a couple of years. It's okay. I have changed the hours of the office to be more friendly. That's for our morale to the dentist. It might cost us money. What we're doing here is one location. We call it the Dental Hygiene Center. I'm modeling it after. Have you heard about the uh, women like this? My wife's done it, the blowout bar where they just go and get their hair blown out. No. So the lady, the lady who started, I don't know, she's just like a billionaire. So no big deal. Right. So this hairstylist is like, it's the same thing, right? This hairstylist is like, we should make a place where people can't get their hair cut, where people can't get their hair colored. All they do is pay 40 bucks to get it blown out for the night, just to look nice. And my wife has done this when she's had to go to a uh, event She's done it when we had kids and she just was busy not take care of herself. It was just a nice thing to leave with hair that was done and would last for like 10 days. So I said, why can't I do that with hygiene? So we have one of our locations, three days a week, has uh, 32, has 44 hygiene slots. Over the year, it's gonna have like 2,100 hygiene slots, okay? We are in network with zero insurances. We do have a membership club, we had to tell you about that. The only thing that gets done there is hygiene. You can get cleanings, exams, x-rays. Cleanings, exams, x-rays. I pay our associates, they're daily guaranteed to be there. I always explain my why. They are, they are doing exams for the day and then they're often scheduling to work at our other office with them, right? So that's it. There's no distractions and we're three weeks in and it's going well so far. That's great, that's good to hear. Um, you're, you're you mentioned going fee for service. How long did it take you? And I know a lot of people would love to practice fee for service. Who wouldn't like to get paid on the time of doing the procedure exactly? And your whole fee, not 50% less or 40% less. Uh, 
how long did it take you and what's your advice to people who do you think it's for everyone as well like talk a little bit about fee for service I, i'd love to talk about this well first of all dentists could fight about everything so they fight about fee for service so let's say we use the term someone says they're vegan right then someone says they're vegetarian then someone says they only eat fish. Then someone says they eat fish and chicken. Someone they, so what I'm sharing is a lot of vegans will say, you're not a real vegan because you eat cheese, right? I got no interest in getting involved in those battles. But I do would say that for context and clarity, we're more out of network than fee for service because we do not require everyone to pay up front. So I just want to share. We don't require everyone to pay up front. We just are no longer, what I am doing is no longer making any adjustments that aren't on my terms, okay? I'll make an adjustment for a friend that I like. I'll make an adjustment for our membership club, right? I'll make a payment in full courtesy adjustment of 5%, but I will no longer make spoiled guac PPO adjustments. I don't want any adjustments made that aren't on our terms. It is, we, I was been in network with plans my whole life. We always had the hybrid PPO or fee for service office. My thoughts, Tarek, you know what I think is funny? Like people predict the stock market and they're wrong all the time, right? The experts are wrong. You get two people on a show tonight saying it's going to be a bull market, a bear market. You tell people crypto's going to the moon, crypto's going. Now, these aren't dentists. These are people in the industry who are experts. So I'm not an expert, but my thoughts about three or four years ago, even before my dad passed away, I got a letter from Spoiled Guac PPO. Maybe people know who it is, but I'm not going to say who it is. And they said, we're reducing your fees for the next year. And I looked at that letter and I said, this is going to be the worst thing to happen to dentistry. Because that letter, Tarek, we don't have the biggest office in the country. We got a lot of dentists, but I'm just going to share with you the amount of money that that insurance company paid us a year was about $400,000. And then the patients paid too. So let's just say it's like 600,000. They were reducing it by 16%. I think it was more. So like that, $100,000 gone. Wow. And yeah. I knew in that moment that I didn't want that to affect my business the way it did. And I knew it was going to be painful, but I believe that going through the pain now, I'm going to be glad later. I believe that Maudie, I call him, you know, uh, Chipotle of dentistry, and maybe I'm trying to be Elvez, maybe Todd Fleischman's more Elvez, but I totally understand Chipotle's model. I totally understand Taco Bell's model. And I totally understand Elvez's model. Nobody is at Elvez paying Chipotle prices. They're not. So I believe that a business model where the same customers are paying drastically different fees confuses the team, confuses the patient, and decreases the morale of dentists. So I'm just going with like, these are our fees. We got membership clubs. What do you think? Right, right. How do you think spoiled guac PPOs can get away with paying two providers in the same office, one less than the other? Uh, because dentists have our dental ancestors, my dad, if you've ever signed up for an insurance plan, you've created this problem. So I have too. So I'm, I'm in the boat. I've created this problem. When my dad and his partner got spoiled guac, guac PPO and they said, we're going to pay 90% of your fee. They said, okay. They didn't know that 20 years later, it wasn't going to go up. I mean, the teacher plans, every, every state has a teacher plan. That's like terrible. We took it in our town because every, we knew all the teachers. It, the gap between what insurance pays and your fees has widened. And I think you're going to get swallowed up in the gap if you don't go to one side or the other. Maybe you go to Maudie's side and you create a heavy insurance office where efficiency and, and deep patient relationships are not the thing. That could be great. Or you go to the other side where you're creating deeper patient relationships with people. You have more time. And yes, there's risk over there too. What dentists want, Tarek, and I never understood this, they want a perfect solution when we know there's no perfect solution. If you're a out of network fee for service dentist, your risk is patient volume. Your risk is people leaving. Your risk is people might expect more. If you're a heavy PPO office, your risk is them adjusting your fees. Your risk is you have to do high level work for a lower fee. I mean, some of these implant cases, they reduce the fee so much, it wouldn't cover the lab bill. What kind of crazy world is that? Crazy, crazy. And history has shown us that that's all they will do. They will keep reducing the fees. But I think, as you said, your, your dad and others who signed up for insurances when it first came out in the 60s, they, they are part of this problem. 
do you think we are too dependent on insurance now to give it up? We like guac so much. Uh, I don't think so, but we're the messaging. I mean, this is why we'll have a part two of this podcast. We can still talk for at least 10 minutes. I'm enjoying this. I just have a, um, I think yeah. the messaging to people early in their careers, we've talked about insurance companies sponsoring dental schools. Is that a problem? We've talked about DSOs having unusual access to dental students, but not allowing the nacho guy to talk about communication. So I think the messaging to the people with the highest debt and the least amount of awareness is that this might be the only way. And I think of it like processed food. I like Doritos. I like crackers, but I don't think it's a healthy diet, right? So right. I, when I go have M&Ms, which I might have after this show tonight, when I eat them, I know that they're junk and I know that I shouldn't eat too much of them. If somebody was eating a bag full of M&Ms and Doritos and was saying, hey, Dr. Tarek, this is healthy food, you would say, it's not healthy food. They go, but my dental school taught me this was healthy food. So I believe that's the problem, is that the messaging to our newest colleagues about dental insurance is influencing the industry in a very bad way. It might need something big politically in legislation to change that, or us dentists coming together I know your time is limited. You have to go. I, I, got, I got eight more minutes, so we could chat for a little more. Leave me with a good word of advice for young grads. So I do a lot of presentations. I do a lot of videos. My team captions stuff. So I want to go to the Rocky for the most basic thing. This is the advice that I have for every dentist to do as early as possible. I wish I did more. I will quickly make an analogy. I played a lot of sports. I wish I stretched more. I regret not stretching when I was 20 and 25. I'm in fine shape. I go to the gym, but I lack physical flexibility, okay? okay. I didn't build my core. So to not cry inside as a dentist because of insurance and fighting, work on your dental core as early as possible. And your dental core is your mind, your words, and your hand skills. Communication is as important as crown preps. You have your whole life to figure out how to do a chamfer on number 20. You're going to get it. But you know, and I know, Tarek, sometimes people never get the communication part. You know, so I know some people never get the business part. They never get it. They don't know the math of it. I mean, they say, oh, I sign up for every plan that comes down the way. I go, that's not a good decision. Some say, I'll never sign up for a plan. That's also not a good decision. So working on your dental core, clinical communication business every day, do not do just what your dental school or the CE requires. Be creative and take leadership courses, listen to podcasts, find a way to develop this core. I wish I did it sooner. And that is my best piece of advice. That's awesome. Thank you for being with me today, Paul. And um... We should do part two. Absolutely. Oh, I want to do part two for sure. Before I go, my mom always told me, bring a gift. So uh, if people text this code, text gold to this number, I'll hold it up. Your phone won't blow up. If you text gold to this number, you will get the Dental Nachopedia Queso Edition for free. What it is, Tarek, is 52 CE courses that you can watch anytime on demand in your phone. Clinical, practice management, Artie Volker, Todd Fleischman amazing speakers who have put content out there that you literally have to click on. So if you text gold to this number, you'll get a free coupon to get that. Thank you for this nice gift. I appreciate awesome. it. Awesome, Dr. Eric. Really enjoyed it. Have a talking. great night, buddy.